Okay. Well, it was interesting uh, what we read there last week. And um, Sister Joy had a good question there for us that uh, was based on what we discussed last week in our Sunday School Thursday. And um, so let's pick it up here now in, uh, did we finish chapter 11 last week? I don't think technically I did because I thought Joy's question, you know, she she was heading us off there to pass a little bit <laughs> because we were discussing these three sons of Terah, Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Thursday we went and looked in Acts chapter 7 where Haran is called Koran. And no doubt that's where the Koran comes from. Uh of the Muslim faith and because um, again we see these ancient towns and cities in the Mesopotamian Peninsula an area there and uh, or the Chaldees of course and the Sabians and Chaldees were near one another there and of course um, the Red Rose city of Petra uh, is in that same general locale. Um, of us. Where. Uh, Abraham and his family's from. So. Where did we leave off? Does anybody remember? About 27 I think. Okay. That's about what I, I would guess. So. We'll pick it up at 27. That's a good place to start. The generations of Terah. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father, Terah, in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. So, uh, 
like my brother Steve used to sing, the old man is dead. <laughs> and um, so, um, it's interesting because again, Abram's going to be called of the Lord. And um, and we talked some Thursday about how that we believe that um, Tara had gotten a second wife because later on Abram's going to call Sarai his sister. Uh, that way he could honestly say he wasn't lying when he told certain kings that, oh, this is my sister. And they assumed that he wasn't married to her, and of course he really was. So, um, God's going to talk to Abram and call him into the land of Canaan, and of course we see he's hanging with his dad up to this point. And at least he's traveled from uh, from from Ur the Chaldees to um, Haran, but he's still not in the land of Canaan. And sometimes the promises of God are usually delayed. God will make us a promise and tell us some things, and they're forced to have, but. God's expecting us to serve him for a period of time and show if we've got the right stuff first before his promises are fulfilled in our lives. And the more that the more that real that God is in our life, the more you will want to express it and you'll be unashamed to build altars and tell people about the Lord and be a witness for the Lord and think of ways to, to acknowledge the Lord and say praise the Lord and do things for Him and be what you should be as far as a witness. And of course, Abraham, Abraham was going to do it by building altars for the Lord. So now we'll pick it up at chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country. See, see, he'd been feeling a, the link of that family and having that daddy to, to lug around with him, but now that daddy's gone. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make of thy name, I make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and will curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So this was a real glorious promise. And um, so we see Terah, he's died, he's probably 180 years old. Uh, and after he'd moved to Haran, he probably lived there but maybe some 25 more years, according to Acts chapter 7. And um, The Bible mentions Ur of the Chaldees, how Abram's being called away from that place. And Ur of the Chaldees, by modern excavations, has been discovered to have been a very luxurious city, had a lot of nice things. So Abram really is leaving the city and going to the country. He wasn't a nomad by any means, but God had called him into that kind of a life. And... Um, I'd mentioned this idea of Haran 
in how that Acts chapter 7 calls it Karan. And sure enough, it was the uh, frontier town of Babylon devoted to the worship of the moon god. So can we be surprised that uh, the Muslims with their Kaaba have uh, had made that their uh, symbol of their religion. Verse 4, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. So he's obeying. Almost, almost he's obeying. <laughs> In other words, he's still got his kinfolk there that he feels responsible for. He's got his nephew with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. So here they go marching into the land of Canaan. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sikkim, unto the plain of Moray, and the Canaan, Canaanite was in the land. So the Canaanites are there. These people that have uh, kind of intermingled themselves with the giants. And uh, so that there's Perizzites and Canaanites and so forth. And Gergesites. And Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Sikkim. Verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now this is the first time ever in the Bible that we've, led, we've read of this word altar. So it's very significant. Because what is an altar? But an altar is a place where men would commune with God. It's a place where we would meet with God. Now we need a prayer an, an, a prayer altar in the home. We need, a, we need that altar. We need to rebuild some altars too. We need to rebuild an altar of family prayer, family Bible reading time. There's many altars that we can erect in our lives, but there needs to be that place, see, where we would meet with the Lord and spend some time with the Lord. So as far as first mentions, this is a very important verse. So the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now this is the first time it says that the Lord appeared unto him. Now that's very important. Amen. Because again, he's going to get busy. He's going to get busy with life and he's going to get busy chasing his own tail. But in the end, He can think back when the Lord first appeared unto him. Do you remember when the first Lord first appeared unto you? See, so hopefully you got saved. Amen. Hopefully you weren't too bullheaded that you had recognized him when he called your name for who he was. He said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Verse 8, and he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. You know, we had some clowns leave the church and one of their faults was uh, we have an altar. Yeah, you're, I hope you got one. <laughs> I think you're pretty thick-headed and stupid if you don't think you need an altar. There's altars all over this book. And uh, that's a good old-fashioned biblical thing to have. 
That's what amazes me at people's arrogance. But see, this is the devil. This is the work of the devil to get you so centered on yourself that you think that you're God. And that's the problem of this age and this moment we're living in. So you got this president. He thinks he's a God. You got a Supreme Court. They think they're God. They can redefine marriage. It doesn't matter up to this point in time. All the greatest minds and men that ever lived. These clowns and Jewish woman think that they have the audacity to change what words mean and change a culture and change a generation and a society and redefine marriage. Man, you talk about, can you be any much closer to Satan himself wanting to be like God? You know what I'm saying? But this is the result of humanism. See, we've come so far from Bible truth. And this is all the more reason why we have to sing out against it. Because, see, these people are tyrants. This is one of the reasons we fought a revolution in this country. Because we said, there's no King George that's got a right to tell us what we can and can't do and what our rights 